الان معنا تقريبا ثانك يو فيري ماتش دكتور معتز الخطيب وي جوت 40 مينيتس فور ذا كيو ان اي سيشن اف يو جوت اني كويستشنز يو كان بوز ذيم يس بليز Uh, my name is Nur. Uh, the question is for Dr. Mu'taz. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, sorry, I'll ask in Arabic. Um, so As you have uh, said, you have talked about uh, political uh, justice in uh, Islam. You have said if uh, there is a, a disbelieving just ruler, It would be best, better than having an unjust believing ruler. In accordance with some of the scholars, some of the scholars have certain terms and prerequisites for the rulers. They ought to be just, they ought to be Muslims, they ought to be this and that. There are plenty of conditions. So how could we uh, square uh, this circle? Yes, justice, justice versus the belief system or justice. Uh, yes, yes, I understood your question. Thank you. Any further questions? We'll take some questions and then we'll answer them. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Abdullah, I'm a researcher. My question is uh, opposed to Dr. Radwan from Morocco. When you have uh, studied uh, uh, ethical phenomena in the West and in the East, you are focused on the internal disintegration, as you've called it, And you have, uh, you have surpassed uh, the diagnosis uh, and you jumped into the solutions. Uh, my question, uh, uh, the other question uh, uh, will be addressed to uh, Dr. Uh, John. In 1997, uh, George Bush brought along a new conservatism And I've read a number of articles about uh, this subject and the prelude of uh, invading Iraq and uh, disintegrating the international order. Uh, the uh, think tanks uh, are playing a major role in disintegrating the world. That means uh, uh, ethics uh, have been manufactured through the think tanks. However, what we call the ideal ethics uh, are being dwarfed uh, are being confined to universities and researchers. Uh, you have talked uh, about uh, 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 His Eminence uh, Pope uh, uh, Francis and his uh, uh, paper. This is an idealistic kind of paper. And this is a theory. How could we uh, put this theory into a practice? How could we have uh, a peaceful culture uh, versing the violent culture that has been manufactured by other Powers, thank you. Dr. Bahania from uh, uh, Algeria, three questions, uh, uh, briefly, please. Yes, uh, my f I I've heard. Uh, uh, what Dr. Uh, Radwan had talked about and uh, the gentleman had focused on the philosophical framework of Sharia. However, we haven't uh, uh, heard the comparison with the United Nations Charter. I just wanted you to touch upon uh, this approach. The second is addressed to Dr. Mu'taz al-Khatib. Uh, thank you for your paper. You have uh, talked uh, Uh, about the dichotomy between uh, the disbelieving ruler and the believing ruler. 
and uh, would it be possible to look at this matter? The other question is to Dr. John Dalla Costa. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, you have uh, uh, touched uh, upon the uh, Christian intellectual uh, thought. Do you think that there is a paradox uh, between the uh, Christian uh, philosophy and pragmatism especially when it comes to the environment the ecology the wars and the crises and so on and so forth uh, there is a dilemma between uh, uh, this kind of uh, approach uh, my question is addressed to the, uh, mr radwan rushdi when it comes to the uh, sunni thought and the shia shia uh, uh, thought uh, how could we interpret today uh, Shiism uh, indeed uh, Shiism has been uh, spreading uh, and you have said that uh, it has been dogmatic how could we how could we read uh, uh, this dichotomy uh, between Shiism and uh, uh, Sunnism Dr. Mu'taz uh, Al-Khatib, uh, uh, thank you uh, for your paper, but I just wanted to ask uh, about the uh, just related structures in the new uh, thought, uh, Islamic thought. Uh, Dr. John, I would like to thank you for your invaluable paper. I just wanted to ask you about the position or the stance of uh, the church vis-a-vis -vis the uh, global crisis in Burma, Palestine and so on and so forth, uh, we haven't seen uh, clearly the position of the church on such issues. Uh, last question from Dr. Najjar, and then we'll have another round. I would like to thank uh, all the panelists. Uh, I just wanted to interact uh, with uh, Dr. Mu'taz al-Khatib, I would like to thank him first for his paper. You have uh, 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 focused on political justice. This is fine, this is important. However, the social justice uh, is also important uh, in this regard, but uh, the Muslims or the Muslim community uh, dispensed with it, uh, ignored it, and uh, uh, focused on the politicians per se. But the Islamic civil society and the community ought to be in solidarity with uh, each other because uh, it has the responsibility of uh, reaching social justice uh, because it is one of the pillars of uh, Islam and there are certain mechanisms in our religion uh, zakat, almsgiving, spending in all its forms and so on and so forth however unfortunately this uh, uh, belief pillar in our society has uh, become forgotten and uh, it has been positioned in the back seat rather than the driving seat uh, we need to shed light on this perhaps uh, thank you any volunteer to answer the questions dr john please do you want to start Thank you for your attention uh, and your questions. Um, one of the questions dealt with how think tanks have shaped the moral imagination or the urgencies in the West. What we know, uh, and there's a, a researcher at Princeton who's written a book called The Age of Fracture, is that many of these initiatives to forge fractured thinking came out of the 1970s as a response to the environmental movement, 
civil rights movement, and feminist movement of the 1960s, particularly in the corporate reality, but also in the political reality, the idea of rights as they would apply to women, as they would apply to all peoples in civil terms, and rights in terms of the environment were a threat to the economic paradigm. And remember, this was at the time where communism and capitalism were in threat, and it actually, in the 1960s, as America lost the Vietnam War, it looked like communism was winning. So this was an attempt to stir up intellectual thinking that would basically make free enterprise free of all restraints. And so a lot of the things that have happened politically, and I would even say I'm not a political theorist, I, I'm not an American, I, don't, I wasn't a part of that whole debate about George Bush going to war, but it seemed to come out of that place of fracture and competitive advantage, number one. Uh, to the question, to the subsequent question you asked in terms of Pope Francis's moral declaration as a fairly, in a sense, idealistic document, I would say that as an ethicist, I have always been accused of being an idealist. Business people would say to me, great, that we should be environmentally responsible. We can't afford to do that. What we're seeing is that the costs of that practicality, which I call the despair from pragmatism, is leading us to actually breaking our reality, to contaminating our earth, to creating injustice to the point where we may not be able to survive, let alone thrive as a species. So what Francis was doing was trying to create a vocabulary for conversation, for dialogue, that says what happens in the economy and what happens in the ecology is of profound significance to what happens in our religion and we need to be in a dialogue of forces. So it really was an invitation to dialogue. There's an awful lot of scientific evidence in what he does, um, but he was the beginning of a conversation. And again, remember that the church, until 60 years ago, had turned its back on the world. It had turned its back on modernity. And this is, again, part of historic change of re-engagement. There are, in fact, ecologists and scholars who are trying to apply this princ these principles on the grassroots level, and that's where we have to go. As with the example that I used from the Research Institute at CERN, we need to see how people who are expertly trying to solve real problems can use these principles to engage them more collaboratively, more creatively, more, I would say, improvisationally. None of us have a solution. We're going to have to experiment together. One initiative between Morocco and Spain has been to try to deal with the economic devastation in the Mediterranean to fisheries and to climate, to microclimate areas. And again, what's really interesting about this example, they actually call it ecological diplomacy is that they use communities to enter into conversation on a shared problem. Whether I'm a, a Spaniard or a Moroccan, if I don't have a fish to eat, the suffering is the same. So how in care for one another's suffering can we manage this resource together? So I think Francis was trying to give us some principles, just as we've heard from other scholars, for being able to, across our differences, <coughs> engage these problems together. Um, I should probably turn the mic over. I've got other questions I know that have been asked, but. Okay, so uh, Dr. Redouan. Uh, نعم. 
I just wanted to talk about uh, uh, two uh, uh, thoughts, the Sunni thought and the Shia Shay thought. Uh, there is no communication between the two, there is violence. When it comes to the Sunnis, there are people who talked about denominations that uh, looked at certain matters superficially and uh, physically and because there are certain seeds for violence then violence surfaced and here we are talking about some people who uh, thought that they are the, the, the they were the vice gerents of God. So when we look at this uh, creed related thought, we can see uh, that under the surface, these kind of issues are simmering, especially when it comes uh, to the uh, stance vis a vis the other. So they are saying that uh, you need to follow my ideas uh, otherwise uh, you will be an enemy and you can be mocked or can be derided so when i plumbed the the depth of uh, the shia related books uh, i i uh, found the seed of disintegration so for a shia person uh, he or she would cleave to the uh, stance and they won't uh, accept the other's position. So uh, this kind of uh, 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 phenomena is there. Uh, it is the Karbala related uh, uh, system uh, where Al Hussein was uh, murdered. They are absolutists, they are fatalists. Uh, and that's why uh, we have seen violence uh, on the part of the Sunnis and on the part of the Shias as well. And this is what had led to its disintegration. The aim is nothing to do with uh, just uh, personalizing the matter. The issue is to do with providing a solution. From my own perspective, I thought that rather than uh, looking at the creed or looking at the belief system and ending up uh, calling the other an infidel we need perhaps uh, to look at the different higher objectives uh, uh, because uh, some of these scholars indeed followed uh, certain deductive uh, matters uh, uh, rather than the uh, pure uh, religiosity especially when it comes to certain particularities, uh, then I thought uh, a cleaving to such higher objectives uh, will be fine within the uh, ambit of the laws rather than the Sharia per se. So I personally wanted to understand uh, this dilemma, wanted to say that rather than uh, uh, being judgmental, we ought uh, to follow perhaps Nusi and Tahar ibn Ashur in the, and their perspectives, uh, uh, i.e. to look at the matter from a different kind of uh, lens. Averos as well, Ibn Rushd, uh, talked about the uh, politics uh, of Plato. And he didn't take much heed of the Sharia uh, per se. He wanted to deal with politics as politics uh, between two brackets. Uh, and that's why uh, such rules uh, on the part of Averos uh, were successful because the Enlightenment uh, uh, scholars, Jean Locke, for example, emulated Averos uh, or his uh, texts uh, were as such. Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his social contract as well and uh, Spinoza when he talked about benevolence and justice uh, being part and parcel of humans. Uh, so there is a coherence here between the Islamic philosophical thought in Cordoba on the hands of Averos and the uh, philosophy of the Enlightenment period uh, uh, that aimed uh, at uh, uh, kind of internationalizing the values of humans. Uh, 
So uh, this kind of vision uh, uh, is enough perhaps to eradicate uh, uh, violence and uh, uh, to perhaps uh, 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 try uh, to uh, emphasize the international values uh, because these values were there uh, in our uh, uh, philosophy and in the Enlightenment philosophy and we ought perhaps uh, to re resuscitate it, uh, uh, if I might say, in order for this philosophy uh, to be uh, uh, depending on the value rather than uh, being uh, depending on the power as per Nietzsche as, uh, uh, or the survival as per Darwin and uh, so on and so forth. So it is a high time for this uh, value system uh, the old one, the threadbare one, to be supplanted with another that is sublime. Because the ethical value is there. The ethical value is an, ex is an existential one. We need to shed light on it. We need to uh, talk seriously about it. Uh, otherwise, uh, 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 things will go pear-shaped and uh, crisis would uh, uh, mushroom invasions and uh, wars and crises and so on and so forth so we need to have uh, a philosophical uh, based uh, system uh, we need uh, to change theory into a uh, practice and we need to have ideas because uh, the changes in Cordoba and the changes that took place in Europe depended on the ideas themselves thank you Uh, uh, three questions were addressed to me. When it comes to the first point, uh, uh, the, the just and its uh, uh, position vis-à-vis -vis the political thought, I think that uh, freedom was uh, prioritized rather than justice in the uh, uh, contemporary political thought. Uh, when it comes to the social justice, uh, it has been positions in the back seat rather than the driving seat uh, in uh, uh, our land albeit uh, there are certain parties that call themselves the justice party there's a justice party in turkey in morocco in egypt and uh, uh, and other uh, countries uh, however uh, there is a problem when it comes to uh, theorizing philosophically and ethically uh, the uh, domain of justice, especially the social justice. I haven't touched upon the social uh, justice uh, uh, intentionally. I did so just because of the time constraints. Uh, when, I, when I talk about Islamists, uh, politically speaking, Islamists uh, focused uh, on almsgiving and uh, benevolence, uh, inheritance, and so on and so forth when it comes to social uh, 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 justice and here the individual plays a major role and it relates to the relief kind of efforts rather than the developmental efforts uh, and this uh, might be emblematic to the fact that there is a problem with the, our governments uh, uh, there is a problem between the ruler and they ruled uh, uh, there is a clash between the two and thus these kind of social uh, justice issues uh, were confined to the individual, to the civil societies per se. And uh, as a matter of fact, it ought to be related to the state as well. The state ought to resemble the impetus or the lever. Uh, so uh, here we can talk about the frameworks, uh, the legal frameworks, the uh, authority uh, itself. Uh, uh, and the actions thereby. But we have a problem in this because the state in our land is not stable or the states are not uh, uh, stable and the, the jurisdictions thereby of the state is uh, uh, blurring or ambiguous. So the social uh, justice, as I said, was revolving around the treasury, the loans, the expenditure, Arms giving, benevolence, uh, uh, being good to your parents and giving them money and the relatives and the poor and the neighbors and so on and so forth. Uh, but 
These kind of resources, in accordance with the classical Islamic thought, took place under the umbrella of the Khilafah, the Caliphate, or the Sultanate. But we ended up facing a missing link when we became uh, the uh, uh, national state uh, or national states later on. I would like to move to the second point, uh, i.e. the relationship between uh, belief and justice. We need to understand the concept of justice uh, uh, first and foremost. Uh, and I talked here about the narrow uh, definition of uh, uh, justice in accordance to those who separate between the belief system and justice. Uh, second, uh, justice uh, emanates from different kind of sources. Al-Raghib uh, al-Asbahani said that we have a constrained justice and an absolute justice. The absolute uh, justice is permanent, cannot change. Like reciprocity like if somebody does good to you you must do good to him or her this is a formula that cannot be changing however there is all there is another uh, justice that is constrained uh, in accordance with miskawi the philosophical uh, muslim uh, in accordance with the changes so what kind of justice we are talking here about uh, when it comes to uh, the dichotomy between justice and the belief system or the disbelief and so on and so forth yes there is the formula that i have talked about uh, a ruler who is a disbeliever and just is better than a ruler who is a believer and unjust here we're talking about uh, uh, the pragmatism if one might say to meet the needs of the people to uh, follow meritocracy and so on and so forth uh, so uh, these kind of conditions that uh, uh, i've touched upon within the framework of justice uh, they indeed can be uh, uh, touched upon under the umbrella of kufr or polytheism or disbelief but our problem is uh, that some people are believers but they are unjust they are the most unjust people on earth so in order for people people's needs to be met we need to have the rule of law regardless of the belief system or, th uh, or, or regardless of being a believer or disbeliever we need to have a law system a framework so that the people's needs can be met thank you just been discussed about um, the notion that justice, uh, a, a sort of a form of governance can persist if there's disbelief, but it cannot persist if there is justice. I think when Ibn Taymiyyah and others quote this sort of a statement that, um, you know, a form of government um, will basically perish if there is injustice, um, they are stating a general rule. I think modern economies of, of scale and modern, um, the modern economic structure and technologies of violence uh, and technologies of governance allow for the persistence of certain forms of injustice because of uh, the amount of power that is concentrated in the uh, hands of the state. Um, if we look at a number of Muslim countries over the last, what's often called the neo-Mamluks in the secondary literature, um, these, these have been extremely repressive. Um, sort of Hume has a, an interesting uh, comment that a lot of the time this kind of repression persists because people feel um, that we can't do anything about it but it is actually incredibly easy to bring them bring these sorts of structures down um, yet if we look at how the Arab Spring has tried to um, sort of bring about a form of justice in societies that are extremely uh, or governments that have been extremely repressive for decades um, it's been a it's it's been the first step of a process of trying to bring about justice. I just think that uh, it's overly idealistic to say that these things cannot persist. Um, the question is, how long can they persist? Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, on a positive and a more practical note, I think the struggle goes on, and people need to recognize that it is a struggle, and they must persist themselves in the uh, cause of justice, rather than I think that these these statements will allow for this to just fall eventually, which inshallah it will. Okay. Thank you so much.
Uh, we have 10 minutes for the questions and answers, so I need to know who wants to ask questions. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so we will take seven questions. Uh, please be to the point uh, as much as you can. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Roussam. I really uh, enjoyed the talk. Uh, I think you mentioned about the, the discrepancy or the difference between people, how long people's lives are between the, the wealthy and the poor. I think I read somewhere that it's nine years in the UK. Um, I just have a question then. I, I mean, I know I'm sure you're one, you know, like a lot of people were kind of against this modern phenomenon of trying to pigeonhole historical figures into modern concepts like paternalism or libertarian. But do you know if the Prophet وسلم, is, do we know anything about how he would have approached something? like that in terms of an inequality that's in society? Would he have been direct or would he have went about it in an indirect way? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Osama Azami. Uh, you, when it came to the Islamic approach or the perspective about inequality, you gave us two views and two explanations. In your view, which one do you think in contemporary times, in terms of the understanding, you would wish that that one becomes a normative sense? And how would that be able to solve some of the contemporary problems that we have in our in country? Terms of solutions? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Shukran, Dr. Osama. Thank you, Dr. Osama. My question is as follows. You have uh, said that uh, you don't uh, like what the Ashaira had said in terms uh, of uh, the issue of uh, the texts. However, the Ashairites uh, were not the only school of thought. Uh, there were different uh, school of thoughts, and I wanted just for you to touch upon this. Dr. Uh, Moratez, uh, uh, as usual, you were uh, splendid in your uh, paper. However, my question is as follows. When it comes to uh, justice, uh, would it be possible perhaps uh, uh, to have it framed rather than being floating uh, a scholar had a definition perhaps in place and he said that justice is to provide anyone who has a need uh, or to, to meet uh, everybody's need when it comes uh, to uh, uh, different manifestations Dr. Uh, Radwan was a bit critical of Islam. He didn't like what took place uh, within Shiism and Sunnism and uh, he resorted to philosophy. And he said that he plumbed the depth of Sunnis and Shi'is and they said that they have the propensity of uh, uh, making the other an infidel. Uh, but this is a bit prejudicious. Uh, we do understand that we uh, worship one God and uh, our denomination uh, do not hold the others as being an infidel. We need uh, to look at the matter politically because there were certain problems uh, between the two. Yes, but we cannot generalize. We cannot say that the Islamic school of thought uh, cannot uh, extend the bridges with the other. Uh, this is a bit, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, this needs uh, review. And the philosophy, the Islamic philosophy uh, that was emulated by the enlightened by the enlightened philosophers in the West in the 19th century uh, uh, did not benefit uh, the West because we've seen the Bolshevik revolutions, the bloody one, and the French Revolution. We've seen two world wars, and uh, the Westerners were at loggerheads as well. I'll move. Uh, to Dr. John, and thank you for your paper that was very beneficial. I would like just to clarify one uh, matter. 
we have seen uh, an intellectual uh, uh, thought for uh, calling for wars, especially after the 11th of September. Uh, 60 Western scholars, uh, Bernard Lewis, for example, uh, talked about the basis of our war, uh, wars, and uh, then the just war was uh, floated within the context of scaremongering and warmongering uh, in the future. Kissinger as well said that the Third World War or the drums have been uh, uh, played upon uh, in order to await for the Third World War. But I would like to thank you uh, for uh, your uh, open horizon, for your openness, and I would like to appreciate uh, what uh, uh, the Pope Francis has uh, uh, floated vis-à-vis -vis the document that you've talked about. To what extent, this is my question, to what extent uh, the uh, uh, Christian extreme right uh, is surfacing in Europe and in the world. We've seen what took place in Christchurch in New Zealand, uh, and everybody condemned what took place, but to, to, to what extent uh, we can uh, uh, look at this phenomenon, especially when it comes to the, uh, uh, to the lack of moderation, perhaps, and the uh, uh, emphasis on the extremists, the right extremists in, in the Western society. I'm very happy that you addressed uh, the, um, the growth paradigm in your, in your speech. Uh, we hear politicians speak about sustainable development and sustainable growth, um, but there have been recent studies focusing on degrowth and looking at societies in crisis previously, as, for example, the Great Depression of the 20s. Um, I'm wondering how we could start to address the growth paradigm. Um, from an Islamic perspective, perhaps looking at Islamic communities. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, please, and I, and I will come back to you. Yes. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Saif Ahmed from London. Uh, my question is to Dr. John Costa. Um, you very uh, eloquently uh, placed the uh, role of the CEOs, board of directors, or the initiators, promoters, as the roots through which the, all the branches, all the staff and the team and, and so on and so forth can perform to their utmost or the best performance. You were, um, this is something very, very interesting phenomenon. I have served as CEOs for multiple not-for-profit organizations for over 20 years. Uh, it has always been my, uh, my philosophy to empower every single member of the staff within the organization to achieve their as ultimate objective and to synchronize the organizational objective and the individual aspirations together. And I, I'm finding it really struggling. Uh, the two points, one is the horizontal accountability um, and devoid of chain of command and control. So while I was on the top, I have agreed a business plan with the rest of the team and to synchronize their individual aspirations, the organizational objectives in such a way that everybody struggles to achieve the goals. My philosophy has always been for anybody within the hierarchy is that if you make a decision, you get one points. If it is right, you get two points. If you do not make a decision, you get a minus one point. So people were encouraged to make decision in their own sphere, whether it is right or wrong. But the ability to make mistake and learn from it, that has been the hallmark of my individual humble understanding of management. I would love to hear from you, your explanation on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, please. And then the final question, yes. Shukran Jazeelan, Syed Rais. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would like just uh, to comment uh, quickly on uh, what the panelists uh, have said. I think that uh, the uh, security as a discourse, as well as uh, uh, theorizing security, 
internationally, I, I haven't uh, heard that the people talk about security and linking it to justice because the uh, issues of justice uh, are linked to security. Uh, people are theorizing, are talking about human security and uh, this issue of facing fear and facing or meeting the need were tackled uh, at the time of the millennial objectives uh, or the millennial goals as well as the SDGs later on. Uh, perhaps, yes, uh, people are not talking uh, within Islam uh, about the challenges of uh, uh, security and justice uh, perhaps with due diligence but uh, there are some Muslims especially uh, Mahbub al-Haq the late uh, Mahbub al-Haq in Pakistan he uh, touched upon uh, facing uh, fear and meeting the need uh, and he linked this with the uh, human security the other issue that we need to invoke is uh, to do with the role of uh, the uh, civil status organizations that uh, uh, might uh, perhaps change theory into practice because they are hands-on, they have uh, uh, the gloves on in order to uh, tackle the issues in situ. Uh, the third point is to do with linking the rights with the issues of development, uh, i.e. to meet the needs and to face fear coherently so that uh, these approaches can be linked uh, uh, together. I think the justice-related issues and the ethic-related issues are trans- uh, transnational nowadays or cross-border and uh, it cannot be confined to a certain country and thus when we talk about inequality uh, this issue uh, cannot be focused in a certain geography and thus this uh, dialogue can be indeed uh, open with the global south because the global south is uh, facing uh, uh, problems uh, uh, on a par with the problems that the Islamic world is facing and uh, I'd like to thank you last question please Um, you propose that uh, to tackle uh, inequality, um, we have to shift away from uh, just uh, perpetual economic growth to sort of uh, a different model. Uh, my question is that if you are going to sort of stagnate economic growth, how do we deal with uh, net population growth uh, for um, economies? So that's one. And my second question is that um, do we think we can decouple economic growth from economic development to achieve um, a reduction in inequality? Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we are out of time. So it's better that we discuss this during the lunch, but <laughs> no, no, <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> so I will give each of you uh, like two minutes to comment on the questions you received. And if you have any concluding remark uh, for the session, if you want to say something before we leave, and I will give Dr. Osama one extra minute or two minutes for, for uh, the questions. Yes, you, you will be the last, sure. if, if you don't mind. So we start with Dr. Uh, Dalla Costa, and then we move further, and the last will be Dr. Osam. So please. Thank you. Uh, several of the questions that I received earlier about the paradox in Catholicism or in Christian uh, intellectual tradition, it's social justice, attentiveness to real world issues, and in fact, what's happening from an extremism perspective. Very, very complicated, obviously, uh, questions. What is interesting about the global ethics intellectual movement within the church is that Hans Kung, one of the Catholic theologians who was an original proponent of the global ethics, recognized 
that are absolute practices as Christians and as Catholics had led to some of the catastrophes that you articulated in terms of injustice, in terms of colonialism, in terms of world wars. And so the idea of a global ethic was to say we can be convinced in our faith, but humble enough to recognize that we don't have all the answers, hence the global ethic. And what I would say that Pope Francis is trying to now embody that ambiguity. Uh, when he was first introduced, people said, who are you? He said, I am a sinner. He began by saying, I don't have all the answers and I'm a failed human being, but I will do my best. The second thing that's really important in Laudato Si is that he actually sources Sufi mystics to help us grow our appreciation of the wonder of nature. So there's something about how we pray together and think about how difficult that is, but that that opens our hearts to deal with some of these radical and exclusive elements uh, that we're all suffering from today. And the third element uh, that he brings to it is really a notion that I think touches on the question around empowerment. As people, we have adopted the mindset that we are consumers or that we are particular citizens of a particular country, nationalists, or that we are producers. And what we need to do in this notion of integral humanity that Francis talks about is recover our humanity. So that's where trust can grow to deal with some of these issues. I apologize for that inadequate answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Redwan. As far as uh, the problem is concerned, I think it is to do with uh, terminology. When we talk here about uh, the Sunni school of thought, uh, in hadith, uh, theology, and so on and so forth, uh, there are plenty of schools rather than one Sunni school. And when it comes to the Shia, we have also schools, uh, and I've... Uh, uh, dealt with these schools uh, for years and years. But uh, what I wanted to say, first and foremost, is the criticism of the ideologues. Bidayat al Mujtahid, Wanayat al Muhtazil for Averos, he talks about the jurist judgment uh, that ought to be depending on understanding the text or we need to understand the differences between the scholars. That means the theology and the hadith and the tradition and so on and so forth, they do not relate to the creed itself, but they have different kind of uh, uh, issues to tackle. When it comes to the other school of thought, some school of thoughts, uh, as I said, uh, they have uh, uh, their own kind of uh, uh, fatalism. When it comes to the imami uh, uh, literature, and uh, we deduce certain outcomes, we understand that uh, the underdogginess of uh, Al Al Bayt or the uh, Prophet's descendants. Uh, the underdogness and the Karbala incident when the Hussein was murdered, this kind of led to this undercurrent that played a major role in opposing the authority and perpetuating sometimes violence on the part of the opponents and the proponents. Yes, there are political reasons. However, intellectually speaking, I wanted to understand this school of thoughts uh, and to plumb the depth uh, of uh, their thought uh, to understand uh, uh, the issues that led to the violence in the first place. When it comes to the other's thought, 
the Western philosophy, I just wanted to understand the Cordoba-related school of thought on the Enlightenment scholars. I discovered that uh, Spinoza was influenced by it. Uh, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, a Moroccan uh, 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 scholar Ahmed Shahlan translated the heritage of Averroes from Hebrew to Arabic and he uh, told me uh, personally that uh, there is a huge link between Spinoza and Averroes and uh, as if Spinoza was one of his disciples so these uh, people uh, tackle the issue of freedom are we talking can we talk about freedom within Quran or not? Can we talk about freedom within our tradition or not? I think that freedom is the uh, the issue here, is the bottom line uh, in, in, in our universe. Uh, so the Western paradigm indeed launched what we call the uh, uh, concept of the state. However, it depended on the heritage of Cordoba. And if we look at the uh, scripture, at the Quranic text, we discover that uh, the text uh, that the jurists depended on were meager uh, because there are plenty of scriptures plenty of texts that talk about uh, freedom and talk about the form of a state rather than just uh, having one text or some text uh, to to deal with uh, uh, in a kind of reductionist kind of uh, fashion rather than a holistic uh, uh, fashion so here again, I would like to talk about uh, uh, the judgmental kind of uh, perspective. We cannot be judgmental anymore. We need to uh, uh, look at the matter uh, in contrast of uh, being judgmental. We need to look uh, uh, at uh, the issue from a philosophical point of view rather than the jurist-related one. The Queen of Sheba between two brackets uh, is uh, uh, an example whereby uh, a woman if it took the helm of power, uh, she can be the manager of uh, the authority. Why not? So here I'm not talking about Sunnis per se or Shi'i per se. I didn't want to flog them. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, and I do understand uh, the necessity of uh, finding a definition, but I'm not interested in definitions, I'm more interested in concepts. Uh, there are three definitions for justice, if you like. Uh, there are three famous ones, the one that you've mentioned, the second is uh, the Ibn Taymiyyah and others, i.e. Uh, to put things into perspectives and the third one is to do with uh, other scholars who said uh, that it is rectitude uh, and uh, to forbid evil and to advocate righteousness uh, this is what we call justice as well but if we would like to ha have to look at the components of justice but uh, there are three the first one is uh, 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 Oh, let's say there are three elements for the concept of uh, justice. The first one is uh, uh, justice, the other one is rectitude uh, or moderation, and the other one is equality. So these th three kind of uh, uh, elements would lead to the overall justice. There's also the issue of the standard. How could we look at the criteria? How could we say that this issue is just and this issue is unjust? In accordance with the Western uh, philosophy, since Plato, there is uh, a debate uh, that uh, uh, talks about the uh, issue of uh, meritocracy. And uh, it developed and it became the issue of the necessity. So we have the merit and the necessity. And now, in the liberal uh, circuits, uh, people are talking about equality and in the UN as well. But since Ibn Taymiyyah, there is a difference between justice and equality. Justice is the equality between co-equals. So, 
we cannot equalize between things that are different. But the problem is as follows. Who would uh, say that this can be equalizing another and this can be in disparity with? Ibn Taymiyyah said that the text can uh, talk about this issue. And we can quote the uh, inheritance rules between men and women. Are we talking here about equality or talking about uh, reciprocity? Are we talking about symmetry? Are we talking about... So there are plenty of lexicons here. There's also the other issue of punishment, the issue of punishments. Uh, uh, if we deal with punishments uh, on a par with each other, then this might lead to uh, different kind of uh, uh, issues that... Uh, uh, and lastly, but I wanted to say that uh, uh, justice is the umbrella. Justice is a concept that is wider than Iman or faith. I.e. the creed or what we believe in and how we conduct ourselves. And that's why Ms. Kawai said that there is reasonable or reason related justice and the Sharia related justice. And this is wider than Iman, than uh, belief. And this would lead us uh, to uh, uh, another issue, uh, i.e. the goodness. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, I used to be an Asharite, uh, uh, not anymore. Uh, the Asharites Ashara deal with the texts uh, per se. And they uh, believe, in accordance with Ibn Taymiyyah, that uh, everybody believes that the good is clear and uh, the evil is clear. And the reason would uh, pinpoint such definitions. But the problem is to do with the punishments and the reward. But everybody, the Asharites and others, believe that the good is clear and there's a difference between the knowledge and the reward. We can understand that this is good and this is evil uh, from our own thinking. Thank you. Then um, and I might merge a few questions. Um, so you started with the wealth gap. Oh, he's disappeared. Uh, how would the Prophet uh, uh, deal with something like this? I think one of the things that we need to bear in mind is there is a historical context in which the Prophet is operating, and our historical context is significantly different. We can draw inspiration from practices that he engaged in. Um, but it has to basically be drawing on the maqasid of his uh, practices. Um, through most of human history, the vast majority of people have been relatively equal. Um, the wealthy would not be thousands of times wealthier than other people. They would be maybe ten times uh, health, uh, wealthier. But um, in a sense, what's changed is the technological and regulatory frameworks within which we work. Um, that sort of new situation calls for um, enacting new policies and and the Islamic thought. Uh, I mean, um, I forget your name, sorry, but you raised the question of um, the growth paradigm, the notion that if we grow the economic pie, the trickle down that will benefit everyone will ultimately raise everyone out of poverty. But this ignores, I think, and and this has been under attack now for um, some years. Um, and I think the the comment from above saying that well, if you're going to stagnate growth. Uh, how are we supposed to sort of maintain or um, you know, improve our economic condition? Um, I think to a certain extent that sort of a remark reflects an orthodoxy about um, how global economics should work, that there should be growth of a certain kind. Um, now, it's, there's no doubt that in much of the developing world we still need continued growth. But as Pickett and Wilkinson have uh, demonstrated and other scholars are adding to the conversation, that after a certain point of economic growth, it's not actually an increase in money that allows you to improve your life. The quality of life does not depend on money. And throughout the um, economic de developed world, this is now documented, that income levels can go to a certain point, but then it's income differentials that create a greater or lesser life expectancy. In fact, I mean, this is also an argument about the benefits of income inequality in the advanced world. People think, okay, you need the developing world needs to be uh, raised from their current status. But, uh, <coughs> sorry, Pickett and Wilkinson show that countries with greater income inequality um, actually have higher expectancy, life expectancy at both ends of uh, the sort of uh, wealth uh, gap 
than countries with lower uh, income inequality. So in a country that has super wealthy people um, and very poor people, if they were to uh, adjust uh, the equality levels, both the wealthy and the poor will increase in their life expectancy. So there's benefits to be had on both sides. But there are uh, remarkable models that are now being discussed and, and proposed that would uh, allow for degrowth, so to speak, in the advanced world, still allowing for the develop, developing world to continue sustainable growth. And then sustainability is what is key, because ultimately the growth paradigm doesn't work if in 50 to 100 years we don't actually have a livable planet. What's the point of a growth paradigm at that point? Um, we have the Hanabila and some people, al atharia and so on and so forth. Uh, what I would like to talk about, it is the Ashaira uh, who are the ones who constitute the majority uh, or the ones uh, that deal with such kind of sciences and institutes. So in our heritage, when it comes to Tahseen and Taqbih, this is a very extended and expanded kind of topic. I did not want to go into the details of such a topic because it is a very wide topic. Maybe in future circumstances I might talk about it. Different context. So inshallah, um, you know, there should be a, there should be social involvement in choosing what the best approach is. We need representative government for that purpose. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Thanks for your engagement and lively discussions. And my apologies if I put you under pressure because of the time. This is my work here now and my capacity as moderator. We stop here and then we meet again after 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, we come back to start the next session with Dr. Ray Gerardini. Thank you so much. We meet after 15 minutes, quarter of time. Yes. 15 minutes. Yes. 15 minutes.